Dante's comedy is an invitation to rediscover the lost or obscured meaning of our human path and to hope to see again the glowing horizon on which the dignity of the human person shines in its fullness. These are the words of Pope Francis, words with um, which Pope Francis spoke of Dante's comedy um, in a message he wrote for the formal celebrations of Dante's, the 750th anniversary of Dante's birth uh, last May um, that took place at the Italian Senate. Um, and it's these words that um, gave rise to the idea of having this initiative this semester. We're, we're gathered here tonight for the third uh, evening um, of lectures on Dante's comedy. This is just part of our initiative called Dante, Mercy, and the Beauty of the Human Person, organized by the Institute for Church Life here at Notre Dame. Um, alongside the lectures, reading groups have been forming on campus, beyond campus, in parishes, in South Bend, and beyond. Um, and it's really a wonderful opportunity to read Dante in his fullness, uh, to read Dante's comedy as um, not just a wonderful work of literature, but a wonderful invitation to spiritual journeying. We're uh, consciously reading Dante from Lent to Easter, journeying with him from Lent to Easter. Um, as with the other um, lecture evenings, there will be two lectures this evening. Um, there will be a break between the two lectures. In the interest of time, we won't have a, a Q&A session after, after the lectures. Part of the idea is that the Q&A goes on informally but profoundly between us um, as, as we talk about the wonderful things we will hear. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Professor Matthew Treherne, um, who is the head of School of Languages, Cultures, and Societies um, and senior lecturer in Italian at the University of Leeds in the UK. Um, at the University of Leeds, Matthew is also co-director of the Leeds Center for Dante Studies, of which he is also a co-founder. Um, and he is also the principal investigator of a very important project uh, funded by the AHRC in the UK, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, a project called Dante and Late Medieval Florence, Theology and Poetry, Practice and Society. Um, this is an extraordinary project that um, running uh, over five years is really opening up new and unprecedented perspectives on, on our understanding of Dante's um, on the context um, religious, liturgical, artistic, social, cultural, political context out of which Dante's um, imagination grew. Um, beyond um, Matthew's um, sort of formal uh, titles and institutional affiliations. Um, it's wonderful to welcome him, uh, welcome him here for, um, for a specific reason that has to do with community. One of the, our goals with this initiative um, uh, this semester is really to create community in and around Dante. And it'd be fair to say that um, few scholars have done more than Matthew over the last decade or so to really do that for the community at large, uh, beyond uh, scholarship, within scholarship, between disciplines, in all sorts of wonderful ways. Um, he's been a wonderful source of uh, energy and life for, for all of us. Um, among the many things that Matthew has been involved uh, with and leading um, uh, recently has been some uh, important work, um, ecumenical work with faith groups in in and around Leeds, um, based, centered around the reading of Dante's comedy. Um, and so it's wonderful to connect these two experiences uh, this evening. Um, this evening, this is lecture number five um, of 10. We are midway in our, uh, on our path, so very appropriate that the topic, Matthew's topic, should be beginning midway, reading Dante in the midst of life. Um, 
Another important connection between Matthew's work and our gathering this evening uh, and our series more generally is liturgical time. Um, we, um, this journey was consciously organized from Lent to Easter with Dante, partly to allow us to reflect on what reading Dante in liturgical time, consciously in liturgical time, could mean for us um, individually and communally. And as it happens, liturgical time is Matthew's area of specialization within, within Dante studies. Um, his forthcoming book with Fordham University Press, Dante's Commedia and the Liturgical Imagination, is certainly something we should all read um, after having completed our, our journey this semester. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks very much, Vittorio, for that extremely kind and slightly daunting introduction. Um, and thanks also to Lenny and to Jessica, um, all three of you, for inviting me to be part of this fantastic, wonderful series. Um, obviously, I haven't been able to be present physically at the previous evenings, but I have been able to see on YouTube just what wonderful contributions you've already had. And I've already heard a little bit from Lenny and Vittorio about just how inspiring the initiative has been to people both in this room and outside this room. And I think that's fantastic. I think it's wonderful to see Dante being read in this very open-spirited way, in a way which um, perhaps sometimes as scholars we're, we're a little, we're quite good at repressing, I think. We're quite good at putting a kind of cold hand on the eager shoulders of Dante's readers. And I think it, it's great to see um, an initiative like this which, which opens Dante up and opens Dante's readers up as well. Um, so we're about midway through the series, as Vittorio says, um, midway through our journey with Dante through Lent to Easter. And so um, partly for that reason and partly for other reasons that we'll come to, I want to take the time that I've got this evening to think about the idea of being in the middle of things, at midpoints in journeys, journeys through Lent to Easter, journeys through the text, journeys through life, perhaps. And I'm hoping to make something of a claim for the condition of being caught up in the middle of things, that this is a condition which can be one of crisis, but can also be a condition of renewal. And perhaps even more strongly still, to make a claim, or to try out a claim really, that being in the middle of things can be a sort of necessary precondition for revelation. Now that all sounds very high-minded, doesn't it? Um, and there's something which I haven't written down and I've been trying to decide whether I should confess it or not to you. Um, and I decided, as Vittorio was saying nice things about me, that a little bit of honesty about myself was probably important because I've uh, spoken to a few uh, friends back home about what I was going to talk about here, and they all said, yeah, it's because you're about to have a midlife crisis. <laughs> now... I think I'm far too young to have a midlife crisis, but as we'll see in a minute, recent research tells me that um, I'm actually just about at the right moment for a midlife crisis. I can't afford a Ferrari, so um, my midlife crisis is going to have to be a fairly modest one. But it's true that I have become increasingly interested in the opening words of the comedy. Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la diritta via era smarita. They're striking lines, aren't they? I hope, I think. Um, the lack of any preamble, the way in which there's no obvious pre-announcement of the subject matter. 
they're bewildering lines in many respects. Now, I've noticed that as I have been teaching Dante over the years, um, I've fallen into certain habits in how I introduce these lines of the poem to new students. When I started out, I took a perverse pleasure in devoting the entire first lecture of my Dante course, so 50 minutes of me talking just to these three lines as a way of terrifying the students and showing just how clever I was um, in managing to make so much out of three relatively, uh, well, I was about to say simple lines. I mean, certainly um, uh, three very well-known lines of poetry, at least. And the way in which I used to do that was by showing how, with a little bit of outside knowledge, you can piece together um, some quite precise information from these lines. So, as everyone who has read the notes to their edition of the comedy, pretty much any edition of the comedy, they will know that Dante is telling us here that he is uh, 35. He's midway through his three score years and 10. This situates us in the year 1300. So it's, it's directly before the great catastrophe of Dante's life, namely his exile from Florence. It hasn't yet happened, but it's about to happen. Of course, the comedy's written a few years later in uh, the knowledge, clearly, that this is about to happen. And until my midlife crisis was looming into view, I used to make a joke about Dante having a midlife crisis, and people used to laugh. I think the reason why it used to be funny was that it seems like quite an anachronistic idea. Um, midlife means something very different in affluent Western societies today as it would have meant to Dante and his contemporaries. Now, the joke has started to ring a little bit hollow, perhaps partly for personal reasons, and I thought that since we're traveling with Dante in these lectures, we're traveling with Dante in these lectures, it might be worth just taking this idea of a midlife crisis a little bit more seriously. Thinking about it, these, these, these lines have provided inspiration and um, nourishment to people in all sorts of situations, I think, in their lives. They tend to tie in with narratives that we have of renewal, narratives that focus perhaps on how human beings, today as then, were able to reach a certain sense of hitting rock bottom, a state of abjection from which a recovery or personal renewal needs to take place. The coming to your senses in a dark wood has spoken to people who've experienced that kind of dark experience. Or else it also speaks to, I think, this opening, the idea of waking up or coming to your senses in a dark wood, a response to an external crisis, something outside uh, your own life, which has affected you and which you need to recover from. And so finding yourself with Dante in the dark wood and finding your way out of that situation can be extremely, uh, uh, can be, a, can be a, a great source of, of renewal and inspiration to people. But for Dante, that external crisis, that sense of hitting rock bottom, is stated slightly oddly here, I think, in that he has been, I think, as I say, very precise about this moment in his life, about the time when this is happening. But in, in the evidence that we receive later on in the Commedia, this precise moment in Dante's life doesn't quite coincide with the two kinds of crisis I just mentioned. So we are reminded later in the comedy of the way in which following the death of Beatrice, as described in the Vita Nuova, he hits a kind of personal crisis, a sort of rock bottom, 
and achieves renewal through a new approach to writing love poetry in the Vita Nuova. This is something which has happened several years earlier in Dante's life. And the external crisis, of course, the exile, is still in the future. We're reminded of that frequently as we journey through the comedy. So this moment in the dark wood doesn't quite seem to coincide with either of those two crises in Dante's life as he presents it in the comedy. So if Dante finds himself in a dark wood midway through his life, I think it's too simple to identify with those particular biographical moments in Dante's life. And I think it enables us to open up a little bit more to other possibilities for the kinds of crisis, the kinds of moment that we might um, identify at this point um, in Dante's life. If we want to travel with Dante, we can perhaps be a bit more open to the condition that he's in or the different possibilities that this condition might represent in terms of the dark wood. And so my joke about the midlife crisis might be worth taking a tiny bit more seriously. Because a midlife crisis, speaking uh, from my research, my entirely um, neutral research with no concern for my own well-being, of course, um, the midlife crisis refers to something that seems to happen to many men and women in affluent societies as they enter their 40s. One of the features of the midlife crisis I've discovered from my reading of the literature is that on the face of it, there is nothing wrong in people's lives. There's a sort of searching, though, a yearning, a churning around of priorities that takes place. Old habits, old practices seem to be inadequate, a bit like clothes that we chose a long time ago that don't quite seem to fit us anymore. I um, amused myself by uh, taking a quiz in a British newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, um, a few months ago, which helped its readers, or aimed to help its readers, to answer the question, are you having a midlife crisis? With 40 questions, it identified 40 signs. Apparently, by the way, according to this newspaper, it hits women at the age of 44 and men at the age of 43. Extremely precise. Um, so now you know. But what was really interesting, I thought, about these questions, taking this quiz, um, which, by the way, proved that I probably am heading for my midlife crisis. Um, I'll stop talking about my midlife crisis in a minute, I promise. Um, but what was really interesting about these features of a midlife crisis was that they, both, they all seemed to point in two directions. One was about wanting to stay young, either by acting young or trying to look young. So one of the questions was, have you started dyeing your hair? Have you started exercising? Have you started taking, suddenly, vitamin pills? Have you started flirting with people 20 years your junior? I answered yes to two of those questions. <laughs> I'll let you guess which two. <laughs> but other questions, other, other features of a midlife crisis included things which made me think, what on earth is so bad about this? Have you started wanting to volunteer? Have you started wanting to make the world a better place? Do you now give large donations to charity? Interesting. So, something about finding yourself at a midpoint, in the midst of things, in the middle 
of things with some established habits that you're perhaps starting to be unsatisfied with seems to challenge certain people uh, to, to bring about change, either to attempt to reclaim a former identity or to reframe their identity, their place in the world. And I think it's quite interesting to, if we're going to try and travel with Dante, to think about how some of these modern questions that modern people seem to find themselves facing at the ages of 43 and 44, depending on uh, the gender. Um, it's quite interesting to think about how this might also be played out in Dante's own midpoint on, in his life. Now, it goes without saying that in talking about this kind of midlife crisis, I've been really focusing on a sort of individual crisis. But I think it immediately becomes apparent in Dante's account that his crisis, whatever it is, however it's defined, is one that is not framed only in terms of the individual but also in terms of other lives, in relation to other lives. The grammatical shift that seems to happen across the first two lines of the poem, Dante referring to our path in life and then talking about his personal story, immediately opens up this question. And of course, the way in which his um, journey from this point is going to take place begins as a social journey the encounter with um, Virgil and will end as a social journey through encounters with particular human persons, between particular human persons. And I think that word encounter is one that Vittorio spoke about very richly in his opening lecture. And I think uh, in many ways that idea of community, the idea of somehow a shared condition of being in the midst of things, in the middle of life, forms a really important part of this condition of being. And perhaps to illustrate this point, we can think about the cantica of the comedy, which perhaps brings the idea of being in the middle of things to the fore in particularly rich ways, namely purgatorio. Because in purgatory, the souls that Dante meets are in the process of change. They are engaged in a fruitful reflection on their past failings. They do so through practices in the present moment of liturgy, of productive suffering, in anticipation of future glory. Something extremely deft, I always think, about the way in which Dante depicts the souls that he meets in purgatory, not as fixed characters, but as souls in the process of change. And this process of change is one which precisely is about a situation of the present moment in relation to a past and a future. It contrasts strikingly, I think, with the condition of the souls in Inferno. The souls, of course, able to remember the past, although they don't always want to reflect on it. They can prophesy the future in some cases, but they can't know the present, as though the condition of being in the midst of things is broken. It also contrasts, I think, with accounts of purgatory prior to Dante's, where the emphasis was very strongly on purgatory as a place of suffering, but this dimension of reflection on one's own past, the past that one carries with one, in anticipation of a future in a present moment. This, this, this condition is, I think, one which is quite... Uh, which is quite 
strikingly different from the accounts that had gone before, where purgatory was described as a place where a debt was repaid through temporary suffering, but this sense of reflection on the past that one carries was, uh, was not evident. I think an important part of this innovative new dimension of purgatory that Dante introduces is there in the way in which liturgy is very heavily present in purgatory too. Again, this would have been very surprising to Dante's readers. Previous accounts of purgatory hadn't included liturgy. And yet from the very moment of Dante and Virgil's arrival on the shore of purgatory, liturgy becomes a really striking feature of the poem. This is, uh, this is what the souls in purgatory do. Liturgy binds the souls together. It helps form community among the souls. They perform together. It also becomes, I think, a way, in the way that liturgy does, a way of presenting a present moment as part of a bigger scheme. Liturgy connecting individual experiences, both with the communal, through performing together, but also with larger narratives of providential history. In other words, it situates what might seem to be discrete moments in human lives with the larger schemes of God's plans for humanity. And liturgy itself, from the point of view of the participant, always begins in the middle. There isn't a starting moment to the liturgy you'd always join in something which is ongoing from the very moment that you begin. And so there's something profoundly liturgical, I think, about the idea of being in the middle of things, or there can be something profoundly liturgical about this. I think that the presence of liturgy in Dante's purgatory and it's important to remember that Dante clearly expects his readers to be calling to mind the liturgy that they're familiar with. The presence of liturgy becomes a way for Dante's readers to think again about how they are reading the poem itself. The rich connections between an individual's life, the shared communal life, with narrative, with providential history. This is something which liturgy brings to life in really important ways. And it's something which Dante's poem, too, I think, invites us to do. The habits that I think Dante expects his readers to bring from being liturgical persons are habits which can enliven the poem itself, which can open us up to the transformations that the poem itself wants to bring. And I think that the kind of thing we're doing here, reading Dante in Lent into Easter, seems entirely in line with this invitation that Dante wants to make for us to read the poem in connection with liturgical life. It's interesting um, how quite quickly after Dante's death, um, preachers seem to have picked up on the comedy as a source of inspiration, bringing Dante's poetry into sermons, um, integrating it, therefore, into liturgical practice in that particular way. So I think it became quickly apparent to readers that this, this kind of connection was one which was important for reading the comedy. 
And I think that this invitation that Dante seems to want to make us to read the poem, not just as containing liturgy, but also as richly connecting with liturgical practices of his readers, also helps us to um, revisit, or helps Dante's readers to revisit their own experiences of liturgy in the light of the poem itself. Dante offers us in purgatory a set of examples of souls who are renewing themselves in this process of change that they're undergoing through liturgy. And in a way, it's possible to see these examples that he presents as right the way through the Purgatorio as offering a kind of commentary on the liturgy, on the potential that liturgy can have. So I think there's a really interesting kind of back and forth that's going on between Dante's presentation of the liturgy in the poem and the ways in which Dante's readers would have known and practiced liturgy itself. So liturgy as being a really important way of helping to understand this condition of being caught in the middle of things and in the midst of things. Now, I want to spend a few minutes thinking about the way in which this condition, Dante's own condition of being midway through his life, caught in the middle of his life, the way in which this condition is, is reframed again at the end of purgatory. In the stunning moment when Dante loses sight of Virgil at last and encounters Beatrice. And Dante's condition at a midpoint in his life is brought to the fore, I think, in painful but ultimately redemptive ways. And I'm just going to read and show you in translation uh, this moment, wonderful moment from uh, Canto 30. From the instant that it struck my sight, this power, this virtue that had pierced me through before I'd even left my boyhood state, I turned aside and leftwards, meaning now with all the hope and deference of some child that runs when hurt or frightened to its mum to say to Virgil, there is not one gram of blood in me that does not tremble now. I recognise the signs of ancient flame. But Virgil was not there. Our lack alone was left where once he'd been. Virgil, dear sire, Virgil, to him I'd run to save my soul. Nor could all my, our primal mother lost ensure my cheeks, which he once washed with dew, should not again be sullied with dark tears. Dante, that Virgil is no longer here, do not yet weep. Do not yet weep for that. A different sword cut first must make you weep. Now, it's tempting always, I think, to read this as a kind of rupture in the text, as a breaking off of the Virgil chunk of the text and the start of the Beatrice section of the text. But I think that's a bit inaccurate. After all, the words that Dante uses to describe his feelings say, seeing Beatrice conosco i segni dell'antica fiamma I recognise the signs of ancient flame are among the most direct quotations from Virgil that are present in the whole of the poem the sword that Beatrice refers to the sword that must make him Weep, a different sword must make you weep, recalls epic poetry. It's how Homer is designated, for instance, in Limbo. So it's a moment that does seem to pull together to intensify some of the past that Dante is carrying, um, the past part of the narrative that Dante is carrying. The moment of naming 
Dante seems a near baptismal moment in the poem. It comes at a point when Dante's deepest thoughts are about to be exposed. Beatrice is about to draw out from him a confession which will come painfully and with difficulty. And I think because of this, um, it also recalls the prophecy of Simeon to the Virgin as described by Luke, a soul will pierce your very soul. I really like this echo of the prophecy of Simeon that we get here. The old man nearing death, encountering a baby at the temple, really seems to capture this sense of encounters between different people at different points in life, that sense of the kind of human lives embroiled with each other at different stages, at different points, and yet intersecting in profound ways. And I found that there's something in this encounter which really speaks to people um, in this way, the sense of the, the kind of the complexity of life, even at the moment of new beginning. It's as though the renewal seems to emerge from something more complicated. And Dante's confession, when it finally comes, tells us both quite a lot and not very much at the same time. When Dante finally confesses to Beatrice what he has done wrong, he says, Le presenti cose col falso lor piacer volser miei passi, tosto che il vostro viso si nascose. What does Dante say that he did wrong? Mere appearances turned me aside. Present things. This is as close, I think, as we get in the poem to a definition of what the condition of the dark wood was. What was it when that marked Dante's condition at that midpoint in his life when he finds himself in the dark wood. Well, he says this. It was that he was beguiled by present things, things which were directly before him for their own sake. And it connects, I think, with a theme which has emerged very strongly in the previous cantos in Purgatory around the importance of differentiating between secondary goods which appear alluring, which are alluring, but which don't give satisfaction in their own right. It's about a confusion between the things which are immediately in front of him and the things or the thing which ought to be human beings' true goal that which underlines all things, i.e. the divine God. So there's something about the condition of Dante in the dark wood where a turning towards the things which were immediately appealing takes over a turn towards the true goal. And I think this takes us right to the heart of the choice which Dante wants us to understand that we have when we find ourselves, nel mezzo del cammin, right in the midst of things, in the middle of things. We're in the middle of things because of our condition as created beings. It's no accident that this conversation is happening, the conversation with Beatrice, is happening in the earthly paradise, of course, where there is reflection on the ways in which, in Adam, the relationship between human beings, the created world, and God went awry and can be put right. And by virtue of being created beings, we are, in important senses, newcomers. We arrive in creation at a sort of midpoint, in the middle of things already. 
by situating ourselves in the middle of things, nel mezzo del cammin, by making that condition explicit, we can begin to recognize something profound about our condition as created beings within the created world. But we can turn in two directions when we find ourselves in that position. Just like that questionnaire that I took about the midlife crisis, we can turn to try and shore up an identity, to try and cling on to the things that we thought were important, that seemed important, like having hair of a color that you like. Or you can turn to try and situate that identity into a richer context, into, for Dante, the bigger context of providential history. That sort of instinct seemed to be underlying some of the possibilities in that questionnaire that I mentioned before. Yeah. Wanting to make the world a better place, wanting to resituate yourself within humanity, wanting to, uh, to try and identify and carve out a new place there. So finding yourself midway through life in the midst of things isn't so much a regrettable inconvenience on the journey towards truth, but it's a necessary precondition and remains an important condition of that journey. And it's worth remembering that the way in which the Paradiso itself opens, the opening cantos of the Paradiso, remind us that we have to read the text and it had to be written within that condition. Those off-putting opening cantos of the Paradiso warn us not to be mesmerized by Dante's song. Remember the way in which the second canto of the Paradiso warns those readers who just want to listen that they need to turn back because they risk being drowned. They remind us, too, that because of his and our human limitations, the account that Dante is going to offer of his journey to God is utterly inadequate. Something of an off-putting admission at the start of the third cantica, that memory and language fail Dante. But I think it's the important point is that the condition of reading all of this is one which takes place within our human limitations, within the context of the midst of life. And so, as I say, I would see this not as uh, a way of moving beyond that condition of being nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, not as a way of somehow escaping being embroiled in the midst of life, but rather a way of understanding that condition, of reframing that condition, of rethinking it, and taking it as an invitation for us, as we read, to reflect on here, as we read, here where we have found ourselves, to reflect on the moment to which we have been given, and to reflect on the ways in which we are able to respond to being caught here in the middle of things as we are. Thank you very much.